In this video, I'll share with you AWS Lambda best practices and guidelines. These guidelines are inspired by my personal experiences while working with AWS Lambda since last uh, six years. Without wasting any more time, let's jump on to the first best practice. So build an idempotent Lambda. So a system is idempotent when specific operation can be applied one or more times and have the same effect no matter how many times it was applied. Idempotence is very important aspect of serverless. So if you look at the event sources like SNS or SQS, they provide at least once delivery feature, which means you can get event more than once. And just imagine you are building a payment service or order service and your Lambda processes the same request couple of times. Try to inculcate idempotency in your Lambda. How you can achieve idempotency? You might have to tweak your logic to achieve the idempotency. Let's say if you're using databases and you can use upsert operations. For example, DynamoDB has already one API operation upsert on this. Apart from that, uh, if you are aware about AWS Power Tools library, that gives you idempotency feature. So you can explore that. I'll give the link in description below. Next is provision concurrency. So if you're working with serverless functions, you might be facing cold start issues. Cold start happens when Lambda receives request for the first time and it takes some time to prepare execution environment. But in critical production systems, especially, you know, when your app is being used by end users, you cannot let your users wait for cold start initialization. Provision concurrency initializes a requested number of lambdas ready to serve the request. So lambdas created as part of provision concurrency will serve requests with low latency and without the cold start issues. For example, you can have 10 Lambda instances as part of provision concurrency and these 10 Lambdas will always be ready to respond. So this is one of the solution to cold start issue. You can also implement auto scaling with provision concurrency wherein you can decide the number of instances based on your traffic. For example, during daytime you have huge traffic and you need let's say 10 instances for example at night the traffic on your website is less so you can reduce the number of instances to two with provision concurrency you are charged extra so you should implement auto scaling with provision if you are having a variable load uh, during different times then the next thing is use like scaling infra with lambdas so you should always use downstream systems that have similar scaling behaviors and capacities as compared to lambda if you see on the screen, we have this simple architecture. So wherein you can see we have API gateway, which would be sending the request to Lambda and Lambda is storing the results in RDS. Let's take an example. If your API gateway is receiving requests 500 per second, then just imagine, you know, there would be 500 Lambdas invoked. All 500 Lambdas will try to create the connection with RDS. If you have worked with relational databases, you are aware that we cannot op open those many connections at the same time. So how would you fix this issue? You have to tweak your architecture. You should use some middleware in between to solve this problem. So you can see that here in this architecture, we have a queue inserted in between. Let's say you have 500 requests coming here on your API gateway, which would be transferred here to your Lambda. So this Lambda will put these many requests into this queue and we can create a new Lambda here, which will pick the messages from SQS and store to the database. Now in this Lambda, we can implement the reserve concurrency. Let's say we keep instances to 20 so that, you know, there would be 20 simultaneous connection with the RDS, which is a very feasible thing, right? So you should always use like scaling infra with Lambda. Another solution is to use DynamoDB instead of RDS. We know that DynamoDB is also serverless database, so you don't have to worry about uh, the scaling based on the number of requests. You have to keep in mind these kind of uh, issues when working with lambdas. So avoid lift and shift of microservices from Kubernetes to Lambda. So I've seen most people are doing just lift and shift of microservices from Kubernetes to Lambda, which is a bad practice. So Kubernetes is meant for scalable container architecture, which are always on, but with Lambda, we are on demand. And when your compute is on demand, you can't compromise on startup times. 
and operational complexity so people have their complex microservices with multiple endpoints spring boot code reactive framework and they just run everything in one single lambda which makes it a lambda monolith which should be avoided another argument would be lambda is uh, suitable for on demand requests and if you handle everything inside your lambda and your lambda execution environment stay put for its life cycle which is 15 minutes then you're not using serverless the right way what is the solution to this problem so first is always implement single responsibility principle so one lambda one responsibility second point is refactoring one microservice into multiple lambdas with specific function the next is uh, avoid spring boot if your lambda runtime is java please avoid the urge to use spring boot it is most common anti pattern in the lambda world so i've been working in spring boot from last 8 to 9 years and it is an excellent framework for developing microservices in java but it doesn't fit into the lambda world so using spring boot other spring libraries reduces efficiency of your lambda functions mostly because of two reasons so first is unnecessary libraries which increases your artifact size which is a, a bad practice which we which i'll be covering second is uh, the spring boot startup time which is really large and which further you know adds to the cold start issue if you are using spring for just dependency injection then i would say you start using dagger or juice these are the two very popular di libraries next is avoid lambda chaining so lambda chaining happens when you call one lambda function from another so this is a very famous anti pattern even listed in aws official documents so this is an example from aws doc you can see place order function is calling process payment and which in turn calling create invoice so what are the problems with this architecture so the first is cost so with lambda you pay for the duration of invocation right and in this example while the create invoice function is running the other two lambdas which are create order and process payment they are waiting for the create invoice to return back the response these two lambdas are unnecessary running while this function is creating the invoice which is really not good second is error handling wherein a parent function has to handle failure scenarios in child lambda hence adding the complexity third is tight coupling so you can see that in this scenarios lambdas are tightly coupled and if one lambda is taking time let's say this create invoice the others are unnecessary waiting which is not a good thing the fourth one is scaling you can see that these three lambdas are tightly coupled and these three needs to be scaled at the very same time so you can see that we have the problems with lambda chaining and we should not be using this pattern so what is the solution as i explained in the previous slide so you have to decouple the systems with sqs or any other event based system for example this invoice can be easily decoupled right you can include one sqs here and process payment will put the messages in the sqs and invoice lambda will pull these sqs queue and process the payments another approach you can use here is by using step function which is a excellent orchestration framework you can use inbuilt retry and error handling mechanisms and which makes it really easy to handle multiple aws services the last one is uh, minimize deployment package size lambda deployment size matters because of two reasons first is limitation of the platform you can only upload artifact of 50 mb size to your lambda function and the second reason is to keep the package size minimum to avoid cold start issues if you have less deployment size lambda environment will take less time to unpack your artifact and hence you would have less time during initialization so when using aws sdk you don't just include the entire sdk so you have to use service specific dependency for example if your lambda is interacting with uh, dynamo db then just include the dynamo db dependency or if it is s3 just include the s3 one the second point is uh, using the dependencies when required we developers have tendency to include open source dependencies in our projects to make our life pretty easy we have to avoid that practice when working with lambda for example 
uh, you can imagine that uh, we have a library Lombok and people use Lombok to automatically generate getter setters and code brevity. So when you are adding an extra dependency in your project, you are increasing the artifact size. You have to use uh, external dependencies judiciously. These were the eight best practices which I suggest you guys to follow if you are developing in Lambda. Uh, you can stay tuned for more videos on Lambdas. Uh, you can subscribe my channel for that. So see you in the next video. Bye.